Hello everyone and welcome to a week of Linux news for the 5th of March 2017. I have recorded this episode a few days beforehand because I'm away this weekend, so I apologise if there is any breaking Linux news that has not been featured in the video. Starting with some news from Raspberry Pi, there is a new Pi out, it's called the Raspberry Pi Zero W. The W being wireless, and it is priced at 10 US dollars, which is ooh, double the price of a Pi Zero. Ooh, ouch, what an increase. But yeah, a $5 increase just to be able to get Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Which, to be fair, adding a Wi-Fi adapter or a Bluetooth adapter through the USB would cost more than $5, so yeah, that's a pretty reasonable deal. So what is the story? In November 2015, they launched the Pi Zero, an entry-level Raspberry Pi which represented a five-fold reduction in cost over the original Model A. It was cheap enough they could stick a copy in the front cover of the Magpie magazine, risking civil insurrection in newsagents throughout the land. Over the ensuing 15 months, the Zero grew a camera connector and found its way into everything from miniature arcade cabinets to electric skateboards. Users often end up adding a USB port to allow them to connect a keyboard, mouse and network adapter, and this hub can easily cost more than the Zero itself. <laughs> the world where your USB adapter costs more than your computer. The Zero W fixes this problem by integrating more functionality into the core product. It uses the same Cypress CW43438 wireless chip as the Raspberry Pi 3 Model B, to provide the 802.11.n wireless LAN and Bluetooth 4 connectivity. The specification for the Zero W includes 1 GHz single core CPU, 500 MB of RAM, HAT compatible 40 pin header, CSI camera connector, and the wireless LAN and Bluetooth. And there is also an official case for it. And keeping on news with these mini ARM devices, Friendly Elec has launched a $30 OpenSpec Nano Pi M1 Plus. It is a more feature-rich version of its community-backed $15 Nano Pi M1. It sizes 64 by 60 millimeters, so that's slightly larger than the original Nano Pi M1, but smaller than a Raspberry Pi Model 3. The specifications include an all-winner H3, quad-core Cortex A7 at 1.2 gigahertz. ARM Mali 400 M2 GPU at 600 megahertz, one gig of DDR3 RAM, eight gig eMMC storage, it has 802.11 wireless up to BG and N, and Bluetooth version four. And it has a 40 pin GPIO connector. So that's slightly more powerful than the Raspberry Pi Model 3, and I think it is slightly cheaper. Sad news from the Manjaro ARM project, in that it's shutting down. This is a post from the maintainer Dodge JCR, and it says, I started this project a little over a year ago with no intent to become the sole maintainer. My idea and goal was to start up the project and allow for people to take over and make this mainly a community-driven distro. In the past year, I have had several offers to help and received loads of help from several people. However, nothing has been consistent. Nobody has stepped forward in aid in building or maintaining. As much as I wanted to see this project take off, it just does not have the user base that we had hoped for. And there is a more complete forum post. News from Web Update. Skype for Linux enters beta, adds support for video calls with other platforms. Yeah, I've lost track of where Skype has got to these days ever since Microsoft took it over. The new Skype for Linux app was released as an alpha back in July and it included support for one-to-one -one and group voice calls, but no video call support. Video call support was added back in October, but only between Skype for Linux alpha clients. This changes with the latest Skype version 5 for Linux. The latest version adds support for one-to-one -one video calls with Skype for Android, iOS, Windows, and Mac. Another important change with the latest Skype for Linux 5 beta is support for calling to mobiles, and landlines with Skype credit. Well, some news from Softpedia regarding GNOME, because I thought I would do that before I do a couple of KDE stories, just to show a bit of balance, really. So GTK version 3.22.9 has been released at the end of February. 
is targeted to users of the GNOME 3.22 desktop environment. It is a modest update that has a bunch of bug fixes and improvements to Wayland support as well as the high definition displays HIDPI. Among the Wayland improvements implemented in GTK 3.22.9, we can confirm that the GTK popover component should now be correctly placed. The menu is fixed to be resized when disabling an action. And keyboard navigation should be more reliable in programs like Vim, because the key repeat was improved under Wayland. On the HIDPI side of things, GTK 3.22.9 returns the screen size when the high definition mode is enabled. Other improvements include the use of GTK show URI on window function, better placement of the rename popover, improved shadow for app and windows after changing the theme. There's a full change log listed on the Softpedia article, and there have also been some translation updates. And now on to KDE, uh, there's been another release of the Plasma 5.9 desktop. We are now up to version 5.9.3. That's been an almost weekly update to the Plasma 5.9 desktop since it was released. Yeah, KD are a bit uh, crazy on the speed of development. There's nothing too impressive with this latest update. It's mostly translation updates and bug fixes. So we'll move along to the next piece of KD news, which has been a project security advisory. A vulnerability on the KD input output information leak when accessing HTTPS when using a malicious PAC file. Now PAC stands for Proxy Auto Config. So using a malicious proxy auto configuration file and then using exfiltration methods in the PAC function find proxy for URL enables the attacker to expose full HTTPS URLs. This is a security issue since HTTPS URLs may contain sensitive information, for example, username and password and access tokens. The attack can be carried out remotely over a local area network, since proxy settings allow detect proxy configuration automatically. This setting uses web proxy auto discover to retrieve the pack file and an attacker who has access to the victim's LAN interface with the WPAD protocols DHCP, DNS and HTTP can inject their own malicious pack instead of the legitimate one. And the solution is to update the latest version of KO and KD libs when they are released. From gaming on Linux, there have been some images released of a new Steam client, and Valve have confirmed that it is being worked on. So that is one of the leaked images. I suppose that's going to be in full colour. <laughs> Otherwise it looks a bit too blue really, doesn't it? Okay, let's move away from gaming and onwards to internet security. So the register reports that Internet of Things devices from a Chinese vendor contain a hidden backdoor that the vendor is refusing to fix. The backdoor was discovered in almost all devices produced by a VoIP specialist, DBL Tech, and appears to have purposely been built in for use by the vendor, according to the security firm TrustWave. They have followed a reasonable disclosure process, but claim the vendor has only responded with modifications that leave the backdoor open. And now the vendor has cut off contact with them. <laughs> oh, great. So they're just purposely leaving backdoors on the system. And this is a fine example of why people don't trust some Chinese products. And this is also a fine example of why I had a good look at Linux Deepin to see if it had any backdoors. And finally, for the stupid news, uh, make sure you're sitting down for this one. IBM has been granted a patent for out-of-office email. <laughs> How long has out-of-office been around for on email? <laughs> Unbelievable. So there's been an update to the story since it was originally written and that IBM have decided to declare that it will not enforce the patent and it now belongs to the public. Yeah. <laughs> Good. I would like to see that one taken to court. Uh, do we have prior art at all? Oh yes we do, it's been around for a bloody long time. The United States patent number 9547842, the 842 patent for short, out of office electronic mail messaging system, <laughs> traces its history to an application filed back in 2010. 
That means it supposedly represents a new, non-obvious advance over technology from the time. But as many office workers know, automated out-of-office messages were workplace staple decades before IBM filed its application. (laughs) The patent office is so out of touch that it conducted years of review on its application without ever discussing any real-world software. (laughs) God dear. Try and calm down again now. Can't laugh too much at this, although it's tempting. The 842 patent describes technology that would have been stupidifyingly mundane to a 2010 reader. A user inputs availability data such as start date, an end date, and at least one availability indicator message. The system then uses this data to send an out of office message. Oh yeah, where have I seen that before? Oh yeah, that's exactly how it works. The only arguably new feature it claims is automatically notifying correspondents a few days before the vacation so they can prepare in advance for the co-worker's absence. From a technological perspective, this is a trivial change to existing systems. Indeed, it is like asking for a patent on the idea of sending a postcard, not from a vacation, but to let someone know you will go on vacation. And there's quite a bit more news about it on the EFF page. That concludes a week of Linux news. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all later.